we're continuing our conversation with Justin Lewis Anthony um, on his book, If You Meet George Herbert on the Road, Kill Him, Rethinking Priestly Ministry. What gave rise to that? What? Uh, why did you write it? I mean, not why did you write it, but, but how did you write it? Um, well, I wrote it. It started off with a conversation I had with a friend of mine as we were walking across Hyde Park in the center of London. And he was having a very difficult time in his uh, parish ministry and because of that in his personal life. He was being too hard on himself. Mm -hmm. And he, I kept on saying, why don't you take a step back? Why don't you take a step back? You don't actually have to do all this. And he responded to me, but if George Herbert could manage that, then I ought to be able to. And I just responded, well, kill George Herbert. Yeah. And I was surprised by the fierceness of my response. Mm -hmm. So... It was a direct personal demand on me to make me think about exactly why this model of ministry was so cruel on so many clergy. Mm. Um, and once I started uh, investigating the rates of stress and of burnout and of, uh, of the loss to full-time stipendary ministry in the Church of England, I realized that um, I really was onto something here. And especially the number of people who came up to me and said, I like what you're, you're writing about in, in my blog or um, in other places. You know, tell me more, tell me more, tell me what your conclusions are. I really did think I was on to something. You know, you really, you really are on to something. I'm, and I'm curious because just this past weekend in the New York Times, there was an article on clergy stress and burnout and how at least the mainline churches were working to address that. And... Um, how some of the, the, the churches in the mega church and growth church movement, um, in fact, one of the uh, uh, pastors who's done some writing on this from sort of the mega church movement has said that the, the, the paradigm of, of growth, 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 growth has produced a culture of um, accomplishment that is becoming self destructive to ministry. Yeah. Which is. And I think that's very interesting that it's not just within the historic denominations as mm -hmm. well. I, um, I did a talk about this in Kidderminster, in the Methodist mm -hmm. Church in Kidderminster, and right outside the Methodist Church there's a huge statue of Richard Baxter. And the Methodist minister said to me, you could write this if you meet Richard Baxter on the road, kill him. Huh. If you look in the, um, the Church Times, the sort of the, uh, the unofficial newspaper of the Church of England, mm -hmm. It strikes me oh, every week there's a, a four or five articles which talk about how clergy ought to, clergy ought to, and there's an every week, every month there's a new strategy, a new initiative, a new way for clergy to actually overwork themselves and work themselves into the ground, mm -hmm. and you know the pressure of growth, 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 as well as the pressure of maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. You know, we want to reach new people, but we want to keep the old people. We want to, uh, to make people feel challenged, but we also want to make people feel comfortable. All at the same time, using a pattern of ministry that was designed in a parish of a hundred people with two curates mm -hmm. uh, in 17th century England, without email and cell phones and tweeting. It must have been paradise. <laughs> How has, the, has this shaped a conversation in the Church of England, and what's that been like? Um, well, I think I'm probably the second most unpopular person in the Church of England, behind um, Peter Akinola or Jean Robinson, depending upon your, your point of view. Uh, the, the, the way in which people have attached themselves to this memory of George Herbert is it's being instructive, you know, you don't want to be an iconoclast in the Church of England, hmm. even though a lot of people, um, a lot of clergy in particular, appreciate the ideas of what I'm trying to say is, but you can't criticize the foundational, um, you know, the fathers and mothers of the church. You can't criticize the apostles upon, whom, uh, upon whose foundation we're building, even if the foundation that we're building upon is is fictitious as it is in the way in which Herbert's memorized. Mm -hmm. um, however, however, there are an awful lot of uh, clergy who have contacted me um, directly or I've been invited to go and speak and it, it strike the, the number of times in which, I mean I could go and write a second or a third edition uh -huh. with case studies of, of the sorts of things that I'm talking about here. What has the reception been like among Herbert scholars? 
which would be a different well, constituency. But. Yeah, I, I was invited to talk to the George Herbert Society in Bemerton, in his own village. And I really did think that I was going to be Daniel in the lion's den. But these are people who know about Herbert and who realize the fact that his ministry lasted less than three years. And so the things that I was saying, which was news to those who only knew Herbert as a date in the, in the church calendar, was old hat to them. They understood it. Uh, they understood it completely. In fact, some of them were even more cynical about Herbert's uh, claim to, to sanctity than, than I would ever possibly be. Um, so, but Herbert scholars, I think, you know, they're comfortable with that idea. They know the real reality of Herbert's life. The, those who approach Herbert from an English literature point of view are fascinated that he still has this direct, direct pragmatic, pedagogical influence on the Church of England and the, the wider Anglican communion. Mm. The fact that people still think that Herbert's book, The Country Parson, is a how-to, uh, you know, a parish ministry for dummies, mm -hmm. but written in 1630. <laughs> It was a pretty tough book to read, though, if it's for dummies. I remember it. <laughs> uh, Justin, you are absolutely fascinating, and I think what you're talking about is of real significance and currency um, for us as a church. Uh, one question, um, that how does this message impact laity? Um, I think it, uh, in... In two ways. First of all, not at all, because a, a lot of uh, people, if they've only, if they've ever heard of Herbert, will only know of him as being a hymn writer. You know, why do you hate the man who writes such beautiful hymns? I think it impacts laity in in the way in which people have expectations of their clergy. Um, all you have to do is, uh, I mean, I don't know the exact terminology for. North Carolina, but when a, there's a vacancy in a parish, you'll draw up a parish profile with a person specification. And it's usually a combination of the Archangel Gabriel and that nice Mr. Bracegirdle who was vicar here for a hundred years, uh, a hundred years ago. Uh, this idea of sanctity, um, personified. And I think a lot of, of, of the roots of that comes from this cultural memory of who George Herbert is. And being able to point out to people that actually what you think as being the way in which the Church of England has always organized itself really was conditioned by um, a particular time and a particular place, a particular society, uh, and is that entirely appropriate expectations to have on your clergy today? I think that's... Um, I think that's wholly to the good to be able to, you know, to drop those pebbles in, into the pool and see where the ripples go. Justin, you also, one last thing, I know you have a blog and um, I mean, you, you don't keep it up at this moment because you're finishing up your doctorate, but uh, tell us a little bit about that blog called The Three Minute Theologian. I went there this morning and looked at it. There's some intriguing uh, posts there. The, the idea being, uh, Bishop, that um, that uh, if you preach the Sermon on the Mount, it's two minutes and 40 seconds. Uh, and if that's a good enough time frame for, for Christ, then I think it ought to be something that, that clergy uh, or those who are theologically trained ought to, to, to try and emulate as well. And it, it, I started it off as a discipline to see, can I say something significant within three minutes for a, an attention deficit generation? Hmm. Um, there is a, something on the BBC radio every morning uh, called Thought for the Day in which it's uh, two minutes and 57 seconds of musing about today and I wanted to see if it was possible to actually say something about the gospel concisely and that was the idea for Three Minute Theologian. Well it's intriguing and we'll certainly create a link to it so that those who are seeing this video can um, catch up on some of your earlier posts as well. Thank you very much. Justin, thank you for being with us. Thank you. I look forward to, I look forward to seeing you in the autumn as well. All right. Fly safely. God bless. Thank you. And keep the faith.